Great. Well, thank you again. I'm the last talk, I think, of the afternoon. This is not as exciting as doing stool transplants, just so you know. But these are things that are important. As gastroenterologists don't always see these. These are usually hospital-based, but some of the chronic vascular insufficiencies can present to us in the clinics. So again, yesterday in uh, Kokora, riding on horses. So very f nice way to spend the day. So this is a very difficult case, a long case presentation that was complicated and played out over two weeks on my service in the inpatient at the University of Virginia and another month in the intensive care unit afterward, the surgical ICU. So he was a 43-year-old man who was coming back for a second admission. He had been in for about three days prior to this admission, complaining of epigastric pain. He was um, not a sophisticated man. He overate, came into the emergency room, and our emergency room physicians admit everybody because of medical legal reasons, and nothing showed up on his test. He had a CAT scan, he had some x-rays, he had some blood work. Nothing was abnormal, so he was discharged home. And he was told to eat lightly and not to, you know, not to drink too much alcohol. So he came back to the emergency room with the same kind of pain, very nonspecific pain, and he was placed on narcotics, slowly advanced his diet, so he, but every time we advanced his diet, he would get recurrent pain. He had multiple tests during the hospitalizations, upper endoscopy, a CT scan, ultrasound of the right upper quadrant, Eventually had a colonoscopy as well. Blood tests were all normal. His past medical history was only significant for some mild hypertension. He was overweight, and he had some ele elevated fasting blood sugars on some of the hospital admissions, but he'd never been recognized to have diabetes. His hemoglobin A1C was slightly elevated, but not majorly. So. One of the times he had an elevated amylase documented in his blood test. So the surgeons talked to him, uh, and he admitted that he would drink moonshine. Do you know what moonshine is? Okay. In Virginia and in the rural parts of the Appalachian Mountains in North America, there are people who make what's called moonshine, and they make it from grains like corn. It's a form of whiskey, but it's not very refined. Oh, okay, there's an equivalent. Okay, every culture has alcohol they can make from different things. So he told the surgeons that he drank this. So then all of a sudden the focus was on, did he have pancreatitis? Was he alcoholic? And that night he had a CT scan that was ordered just to look at the pancreas. So it didn't really look too far down, and so this was normal. So we didn't worry about him that for pancreas. Then the next day, he had severe shortness of breath. He was very uncomfortable. His blood pressure went high, his respiratory rate. So we worried that he might have a thromboembolic event. So we had a CT angiography to look for pulmonary embolism, and this was negative. So the next day, now this is Thursday. This is a long admission. The surgeon who had been seeing him came in, and he planned to do an exploratory laparotomy the next day if the pain continued. But he got better, nothing happened. So the surgeon, there was a major, I forget which surgery meeting it was, a major surgery meeting. So the surgeons all kept leaving. So the head one that was seeing him disappeared on Friday to go to this meeting. So then another surgeon, his colleague, who was also a colorectal surgeon, came to see him on Saturday and he was still not too bad. And the next day, Dr. Friel came and saw this patient. When his pain became very severe again, he became really agitated, hypotensive, but all the time his abdomen was unremarkable. There was nothing. He had no abdominal bruise. He had bowel sounds. And it was mildly distended, but no peritoneal signs. So on Sunday morning, this partner came in again, saw him, and he followed him. And as I left, this was supposed to be my last day on the inpatient service. And I saw him around noon hour. He had a lot of family and he was complaining of pain. But by two in the afternoon, 
the intern and the, fel the resident were trying to um, uh, help because he had his whole big family, about 12 people in there, and everybody was getting angry, upset. I didn't know about this at the time. But finally, later that night, he had a CT scan that showed, and I am sorry I don't have it because I'm not at the University of Virginia anymore, but it showed a horrible picture of ischemic small bowel, the whole small bowel, and the right part of his colon. So by this point, the surgeon couldn't operate. He stayed overnight. He caught a plane the next morning. So the most junior surgeon, who was a fourth-year laparoscopic fellow, had the honor to do this case. And it was difficult. He got some vascular surgeons to come in with him. And what happened was the omentum, you know, we call it the policeman of the abdomen, the omentum completely covered all of this. When they opened up his abdomen, his entire small bowel was liquefied. There was no small bowel left. There was just part of his necrotic-looking right colon. He was not acidotic on Sunday, but they had to take out his entire small bowel. They took a, a tube into the stump of his duodenum, and also they resected his colon. They gave him a defunctioning colon, and he was placed on intravenous antibiotics. He was placed on um, parental nutrition. And in fact, he kept having to leave the ICU to go back downstairs to the operating room. He never made it up to the ICU because he kept thrombosing some of the arteries. And so they had to get the vascular surgeons to open up some of his, his hidden no pulses in his feet. There was a remote history of sagittal sinus thrombosis that came to light talking to the family. It was at another hospital. So we got the hematologist to see him because we realized he must have had some unusual clotting disorder. And in the one month that I periodically followed him in the ICU, they were not able to give a specific diagnosis. He was put on subcutaneous heparin, and he went home with TPN after one month in the ICU with unclear prognosis. Obviously, his long-term possibility is uh, very difficult. So uh, I don't know about you, but when I was in medical school, and even as a gastroenterology fellow, the thing I found the most difficult to understand were all these different mesenteric syndromes where we have not enough blood flow going to the small bowel, the colon, the acute, chronic, arterial, venous, mixed, thrombotic, non-thrombotic, and so I'm going to just give a quick review. Intestinal perfusion. So our splanchnic vascular bed is very important. It, about one-third of our total blood volume is in our, ga in our intestinal uh, circulation. 30% of our cardiac output, 1,800 mLs per minute, goes to the GI tract. So the GI tract, we take for granted that it's always perfused, but if it's not, it can be problematic. It actually has a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of co collateral circulation, overlapping vascularization of the small bowel and the colon by and large, and therefore it can tolerate a reduction of 75%, so three quarters lower than normal. Our small bowel and colon can tolerate the reduction in blood flow. However, if it can tolerate that, sometimes the reperfusion after a a clot moves on or after trauma, the anoxia gives rise to a lot of oxidative radicals that cause damage, and you've heard of the term ischemia reperfusion injury. So sometimes the reperfusion causes more of the damage than just the lack of vascular flow in the first place. So 60% of episodes of intestinal ischemia are believed to be arterial. 40% of them embolic, 40% thrombotic, and 20% mixed. 90% of them are acute, involving the superior mesenteric artery. 10% are chronic, and mainly the inferior mesenteric artery. In that situation, some of them are superior mesenteric artery. 30% are venous in origin, and 10% are a combination of arterial and venous insufficiency. All of you, I think, are familiar with the causes of mesenteric ischemia, but just to remind you, atherosclerosis, which is especially a problem in elderly patients, embolic for people who have cardiac disease, or they can be embolisms from the atherosclerotic plaque in the main arteries, then embolizing into smaller arteries, which can cause, if there's lots of showers of emboli, 
then that may cause insufficiency of the arterial blood flow. Mesenteric venous thrombosis is a very rare cause of an acute mesenteric insufficiency, but it can cause the more chronic forms of mesenteric insufficiency. And typically these patients, quite a few of them, has a history of venous thrombosis. So again, when you take a history from these patients who have chronic abdominal pain, we should be alert to these chronic mesenteric syndromes, ask them about other thromboembolic disease such as DVTs. Unfortunately, some of the worst cases beside this one that I've seen of intra-abdominal vascular insufficiency are due to trauma. Vascular accidents from car accidents, and unfortunately in the U.S., I never saw this in Canada, but I have in the U.S. where lots of people get gunshot wounds. Uh, you know, when I moved to Texas from Canada, the average number of firearms per man, woman, and child in Texas was four. In Canada, it's way, way less than that. So in Texas, I saw people who had gunshot wounds, and, and we all do in a lot of our hospitals, probably Columbia too, I don't know. So that's another source of vascular accidents where the, the vasculature is, is ruined and they have to have a short bowel. So, but also inflammation, diverticulitis, appendicitis, occasionally can cause rise to thrombosis, and then they can have secondary mesenteric ischemia. And occasionally, aortic dissection will also knock off uh, the bowel as well, the sources of vasculature. And then the other thing we forget, typically, is that there are a lot of inherent or acquired, um, acquired increase in coagulation. And this is probably what this man in this situation had. And we don't always think of that, but it can give rise to vascular uh, insufficiency. So mesenteric insufficiency syndromes can be acute mesenteric ischemia. And in my subsequent talk, AMI is not acute myocardial infarction. It's acute mesenteric ischemia. So SMA thrombos or embolus in the small superior mesenteric vein thrombus, non-occlusive causes like drugs, sepsis, other causes, vasculitis as well, chronic mesenteric ischemia and ischemic colitis. The classical presentation of acute mesenteric ischemia, which in retrospect this man had, even though it was a very start and stop kind of presentation, as he kept probably thrombosing different sections because of his pro-coagulant setting, is there's always pain out of proportion to the physical findings. And in our gentleman, he never became acidotic, and he never developed peritonitis because, that we could perceive because of his omentum. He never had vomiting or diarrhea. It was primarily pain. He never lost his bowel sounds into the last 24 hours. And he didn't have these findings until the day he was going to the operating room. So typically, there's increase in white blood cell count, amylase. Then that was probably that one raise in amylase that we saw when we got the CT scan to look at his pancreas. And had we got a full CT that day, we probably would have seen something going on, but we really only saw the pancreas and, the, and the, the chest in that CT. And same with the CTPA, was focused on his lungs. So the management of these individuals is totally supportive. You want to assess them with a CAT scan or angiogram. CT angiography is used very commonly. And the treatment is very focused on the cause and the location of where the mesentery ischemia is taking place. The most common vascular disorder of the intestine is chronic mesenteric ischemia. It's relatively unusual, even though it's common, and this is due to the fact that there's a lot of redundancy in the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery, that there's collateral circulation. Unless you have a major problem, such as our man did, where he was clotting off all kinds of different arteries, usually people who throw a thrombus or have isolated atherosclerosis, you don't present with such a catastrophic presentation as this man. Typically, this is more common in women, the chronic mesenteric insufficiency. Again, the evaluation is similar to the acute setting, but people tend to forget to be aggressive in these situations. These individuals have this postprandial um, abdominal pain that's rather nonspecific. They get bloating, they lose weight, and they 
if you examine them, you may hear abdominal bruise reflect the atherosclerotic vessels. So this is clearly a diagnosis that is overlooked. There are patients, if you look at uh, case reports of people coming in who are terribly cachectic, especially if they live in a nursing home, this is overlooked. And so when you see a patient like this, you have to think about it and get a CT angio. Um, occasionally you'll get a formal angi angiogram and occasionally an exploratory laparotomy. These days, endovascular techniques are being used more and more by the surgeons if it's a limited amount of vascularization that needs to be treated, or of course, if there's a specific abnormality, then treating the underlying cause is important. Ischemic colitis, I think, is the thing that we see the most as gastroenterologists of all the vascular syndromes, typically because they present not with sim vague symptoms, as they present with bloody diarrhea which means, generally speaking, at least in the U.S., we get called to do a colonoscopy on them. Now, the presentation is fairly characteristic. Typically, this is a self-limited disorder, and the outcome is generally good from ischemic colitis. The recommended treatment, again, is supportive. IV fluids, keeping them, um, give them heparin prophylaxis or mechanical prophylaxis if they can't take heparin, because they're at high risk, they're usually older patients, they may be at risk of other thromboembolic diseases, including DVT. Antibiotics may be used. Some of them get parental nutrition. In my experience, it's typically fasting, heparin prophylaxis, and IV fluids for these patients. Now, there are instances when patients need to have colon resection because they develop peritonitis, they may have gangrene, and occasionally later, not an acute stricture, but down the road with healing, they may have a stricture that requires surgery. And occasionally there's uncontrolled bleeding, but that's probably the most rare indication for surgery related to ischemic colitis. And again, it would be in the acute setting. So this is a classical picture of ischemic colitis. If it's not overtly bleeding, you may have to think of pseudomembranous colitis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's colitis, depending on the history, radiation colitis. It is not necessarily specific for ischemic colitis. Biopsies may help you because you see hemosiderin deposits that tend to make it look different from the other types of acute colitis as well. So, but usually we want to make sure that we're not missing an infectious cause and that this is truly ischemic. So this shows up here. Some of the areas of the colon are far more prone to ischemia, which are shown in the blue color. You can see the watershed areas either at the top of the descending colon in the rectosigmoid or in the right colon. So most of the cases I've seen fortunately affect the, the left colon and uh, going up into the splenic flexure. The reason why it's fortunate, because these people who have left-sided ischemic colitis have a better prognosis than people who have right-sided ischemic colitis or panischemia, which is, is another factor that's not great. There is a very recent, it's an EPUB at the present time, systematic review using all kinds of uh, uh, ways of analyzing data and using Cochrane system. They looked at over 2,600 publications. They included eight retrospective case series and three case controlled series that totaled over 1,000 patients. What they found was that, and again, these are between ICU people, gastroenterologists, surgeons, there are different groups that manage ischemic colitis, that medical management occurred in 80% of them, 6.2% of those medically managed died. And again, this is retrospective. Some of them went on to surgery, almost 20% of them, almost 40% died, but it's like um, Chris just said about uh, the looking at some of these retrospective studies. Obviously, the patients who went to surgery were perceived to be more ill to begin with, so we really can't comment on this retrospective study, but obviously, the decision to go to surgery should be taken carefully because potentially you may not have a good result. The overall mortality in this retrospective view of all these studies was almost 13% for ischemic colitis. Now, I have to say in my own practice, I don't believe I've seen this high a mortality 
but remember I'm seeing probably the good cases. I do mainly outpatient gastroenterology, some inpatient, and the patients I see are not the very sickest because they probably end up seeing the surgeons, first of all. They looked at predictors of a poor outcome, and in this study, like many older studies, right-sided ischemic colitis is the most significant predictor of a poor outcome, and also the absence of rectal bleeding is predictive of a poor outcome, probably reflecting the right side again. It's not an independent variable. Renal dysfunction, which reflects the systemic effect probably of ischemia, hypovolemia, potentially even ischemia affecting the renal system. And obviously, when peritoneal signs arise, then we are looking at something that's transmural, most likely beyond just the level of mucosal injury. So the long-term effects of these mesenteric ischemic syndromes, um, if you look at the ones not involving the colon, involving the small bowel in particularly, there may be a requirement in many of these individuals who have prothrombotic situations where they're placed on anticoagulants for the rest of their life. And of course, long-term anticoagulation has its risks, as, as we all know. The biggest thing is when small bowel is resected, and of course, the patient I presented has the ultimate in the small bowel. He has no small bowel, functionally. He has the stump of his duodenum that emerges from his stomach. So he's at risk of dehydration, diarrhea. In his case, he doesn't have diarrhea even. Um, just he has a defunctioning colon. Malnutrition, fatty liver, and there's so many other problems. This man's likelihood of developing diabetes from fatty liver, from cirrhosis, is very, very high. He already had an elevated hemoglobin A1C to begin with, family history of type 2 diabetes. So I don't know what happened to him. I'm surprised that the hospital didn't get sued, but we didn't. I involved risk management very early in this case because everyone was upset clearly about him. Um, but most of these individuals who have, short, who have vascular accidents from injury from gunshot wounds and abdominal trauma often end up on TPN. But if they're healthy, they may have a good prognosis. It's like all patients on long-term parental nutrition. They, these are not usually candidates or good candidates for small bowel transplantation. First of all, small bowel transplantation is not a successful uh, type of plan, uh, transplantation, it's not like kidney transplants. Also, some of these individuals are not candidates for small bowel transplantation due to their age, their comorbidities, or if they have any of these prothrombotic coagulopathies, then obviously they're not uh, in that setting. Ischemic colitis, the long term, depends on whether they have had a resection, they may have chronic diarrhea, they may have stricturing. And of course, they're at risk, depending on the underlying cause, they may have recurrent ischemia. And many of these patients end up being on aspirin, potentially Plavix, or anticoagulants, depending what their risk is. And of course, that brings in new complications for their pa the patients. So this, I think, um, is not something we all deal with, but, but clearly these are emergencies when we see them. They, except for the chronic ones, but sometimes chronic mesenteric ischemia turns into emergency when it's unrecognized and it becomes critical and causes enough ischemia that they end up with um, a gangrenous bowel. And I think all of us have seen this in our training. So the interesting thing about this is mortality rates for all these mesenteric ischemia syndromes have not improved in the past decade. We've made no new developments in this area. Still early diagnosis and recognizing the condition, making a proper diagnosis is most important because we may have an impact, we may have impact through surgery or medical therapy with thrombolytic agents or anticoagulants. Acute mesenteric ischemia has the highest mortality. Chronic mesenteric ischemia can be sometimes managed medically. Ischemic colitis is not rare, but usually the management is supportive, and overall the long-term uh, outcome is good. And so as gastroenterologists, we don't always have to deal with the bad part of it, but we have to be able to recognize when somebody's going south and needs the help of our surgical colleagues, whether it's colorectal or vascular surgeons, who may both need to be uh, involved. So 
And again, that's me riding last yesterday. <laughs> so I'm not much of a horse rider, as you can see. Thank you very much. And thank you again for inviting me here.